Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to a seminar, an ACC uh, seminar. My name is Hui Zhang, and I'm a professor of biostatics in the Department of Preventive Medicine in the Northwestern University, Feinberg School of Medicine. Uh, I hold, also hold a joint appointment in the Metzlerin uh, Center here, Metzlerin Center for the Cognitive Neur Neurology and the Autonomous Disease Center here. I got my PhD from University of Rutgers in 2010, 2020, to, sorry, 2010. Uh, after that, I joined the St. Jude Children's Research Hospital at the faculty. After nine years, in 2019, I moved to the Northwestern University. Another speaker today is that we have, likely have uh, Mr. Nathan Gill. Nathan got a better degree and also my MS, both in aesthetics from, from University of Chicago. Uh, he joined us last year as our statistical analyst. And uh, today, uh, we will talk about the detection of oral dispersion in con data with the convenient online shiny APP. And, uh, I will focus on the theoretical part, and then this thing will talk more on the, um, the shiny APP application part. Let me first share my screen. Could everybody see my screen now? My share screen, this thing can see. Okay. Yeah, looks good. Okay. And before, um, before you start, I just want to um, tell everyone, if you have questions, um, send them to the chat, um, and I will either answer them or um, stop Hui and have him answer them. Okay, great. Thank you. So, the, so first, what are the con data? We are going to talk about the oral dispersion for con data. So what's con data? In statistics, con data is, is a special type of measurement. For this type of measurements, it only takes the value of non-negative integers. For example, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, till infinity. So in statistical uh, world, another type of data, it also has this kind of feature. They only take the non-negative integers. That's called a binomial data. But the difference between the count data and the binomial data is a binomial has a cap. For example, the count data, count data can be like a yesterday in the whole world, how many people have been diagnosed with COVID-19? Or how many people died in a particular country like maybe Argentina? So that's count data. For binomial data, usually they have a small cap. For example, in last week, how many days did you drink alcohol? This value has to be non negative integer. For example, it can be zero days, one day, two days, five till seven days. But it cannot be on the seven days because it, you know each week they have at the most seven days. So that's the difference between binomial and count data. Of course, for the binomial data, if the cap goes to infinity, it will become count data. And then when the cap goes to one, in that case, you can only take the, the, the value of zero and one, it's called bi binary data. You know, there's a binary, you can only take the value of zero, one, or you could call it as a yes, no. So that's count data. So why we want to talk about count data today? Because count data nowadays is very common for biomedical and clinical research. For example, for the Alzheimer's disease research, lots of time you have measures called the neuron counting measures. Lots of these kind of measures are count data. And also in the past decade, lots of rapid pro progress for the new biomedical techniques. They generate lots of count data. For example, nowadays, even in Alzheimer's disease, disease, we do lots of sequencing. For the next generation sequencing, we generate lots of count data. One type of next generation sequencing is RNA seq. Here is the figure out of illustrate RNA seq. You got a total RNA from your sample. Let me get a point, uh, pointer here. So you got your total RNA from your sample, and you cut them by using some enzyme to small segments. This segment you can ramp rapidly amplified to multiple seg uh, segments. After your amplification, you can map these segments back to your DNA sequence. And if some gene has a higher transcription level, transcription means from DNA to RNA. If some gene has a higher transcription level, you will have more RNA for this gene. And correspondingly, you will have more numbers of segments after PCR amplification. So finally, the data you can get is uh, for each gene, how many segments map to this gene, to each particular gene. So that's a copy number, that's called a copy number. So copy number is a very typical count data. That's one of the techniques, new techniques in the past case, generate lots of count data. 
but not only for next generation sequence. There is another example. For example, in you know, Odama disease, you know, for the past decade, we don't have any new drug, but some new some drug is on the phase three clinical trials. For example, this is a drug called the GV971. Right now, it's on the phase three multiple center randomized double blinded uh, 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 phase three trial, starting, I think, from last year in October 2020. So for this drug, what's the mechanism? The mechanism of this drug is called a gut brain axis. This drug will work in your intestine. And then they have effect, they deliver their effect to your brain. That's why that may, have, may be able to help the Alzheimer disease treatment. But this, the, this drug actually already proved in China two years ago in 2019. Right now they are doing the phase three global uh, clinical trials. But not only for this group, they have this drug. Early this month, in March, March 3rd, a group in Oregon also published another paper discussed the relationship between the gut microbiome and the Alzheimer's disease. But for the microbiome, what's the, what's the microbiome data? Microbiome is actually give you the measurements for each type of bacteria in your gut and what's their abundance. The abundance means actually also the only data is also copy number for each type of bacteria. What's how many bacteria for, you know, in your sample? How many are there? That's another copy number. So for the copy number, that's also count data. So how to model count data from a very basic and you know probably very elementary set of course everybody learned for count data most people use the Poisson distribution. That's the most popular one to model count data. In addition to Poisson, we have some other distribution. For example, negative binomial distribution. So for both Poisson distribution and the negative binomial distribution, you can define them by the close mathematical formula or mathematical equation. That's why they have parameters. We call that parametric model. So parametric method. So also for count data, we also have some semi-parametric method. For, the, for example, quality like for the Poisson. So they are typical method to model count data. So as I mentioned, the Poisson is the most popular one. So Poisson is the parametric method. So what's the close form to define Poisson or describe Poisson? Here is a probability mass function for the Poisson distribution. Probability mass function means that it gives you the distribution, this distribution for each particular number, what's the chance for this variable to equal to this particular number. For example, in this distribution, what's the chance for V equal to zero? You can plug zero in, this one will become the E in power of negative lambda. Or if you want to know what's the chance for V equal to one, you plug one in, here become, become to the E in power lambda multiply lambda. That's a chance for this variable to equal to one. So that's a probability mass function of Poisson distribution. It defined the Poisson distribution. But from this formula, you can tell it had only one parameter. It's called a single parameter distribution, the parameter the lambda. So actually we can derive the mean is lambda. The mean actually means the expected value of this Poisson distribution. The mean is lambda and also the variance is also lambda. So this is a very important feature for Poisson, the mean equal to variance. However, in the real count data, very frequently you can see that you, if you, you calculate it, you find that the mean, the variance is the much larger than mean. Actually, when this one occurs in the Poisson that doesn't hold, this is called a over dispersion. So when the over dispersion occurred, you shouldn't use the Poisson anymore, otherwise you get a biased result. In that case, we should use the other method, like the two we mentioned in the two, uh, in the slide before. We may use the, want to use the negative binomial or quality like the Poisson. So as I mentioned, the RNC data is a very common count data. So how to analyze the RNC count data? 10 years ago, some scientists published this paper. They proposed a two-stage Poisson model to analyze the RNC counts. They have two stages. Stage one, they want to, to detect if there is the old dispersion. If there is the no old dispersion, at stage two, they will use the Poisson to maximize the you know, analysis power. However, at stage one, if you detected found there is the old dispersion, at stage two, they will use the negative binomial. So the idea is simple, right? But that's a very big in progress, a very big in, uh, progress for the RNA data analysis. So this paper I just checked last night, have been 
started for more than 160 times. You know, this number is not very high for a clinical paper or for a biomedical paper, but for the statistical methodology paper, that's a pretty good number. So their paper published in 2011 in this journal, statistical application in genetics and molecular biology. On second year, on same journal, we published a paper. We published a paper, we try, you know, as I mentioned, that's my previous uh, affiliate institute. I worked there for nine years and I moved to Northwest in 2019. So in our paper, we try to introduce the empirical basin selection to this method. And also at stage two, we also do the same stage one. Uh, at stage two, we try to use the quality like the Poisson rather than negative binomial. But for both their paper and our paper, a critical step is stage one to detect the early dispersion. You don't want to make a lot of mistakes there for detect the early dispersion. So how to detect early dispersion for candida? That's a very important issue. That's why we are going to talk about this topic today. Detect the early dispersion, we have multiple, we have multiple methods. The first method, the type of method, we call the parametric method. For example, we let the V given X for subject I, we let the follow Poisson, we write the lambda, the single parameter lambda, we write it at the Ri multiply by mu, with the mu i. So <clears throat> if Ri is a constant, you know, this is a lambda, simple lambda. You know, sometimes maybe, you know, you have different situations, different factors that may affect your distribution. So we assume that if we assume Ri for the gamma distribution, that's a very common way, we can rewrite this uh, probability mass function. By here, you can derive what's the mean and the what's the variance. You can detect if it's, a, the, you can test if there is any word person. Okay, I got a question here. Maybe I want to answer here right now. Some instrument in the clinical course use, uh, use could be analyzed with counter models, but they have floor and the ceiling effect. What do you recommend it? That's a very good question. I don't have time to talk today, but I have a similar experience. I have experience in St. Jude, the children's hospital. That's also the new continental measuring. The, they have the flooring effect. All the score is beyond 50. The lower score is 50, but the beyond 50 is a positive integers. What I did for the slower effect, I minus everything by 50. So my new floor would be zero. So then I can, I can use the Poisson negative binomial. We will have a cap, we will have a ceiling effect. You have seen if that means that you have cap, you may want to use binomial rather than Poisson. That's my answer for this question. Okay. So let's continue here. This is a one type of method called the parametric method I got the introduced. Another type of method that is a semi-parametric method. They, they have two different uh, subtypes. One is called a savage estimate for the asymptotic variance. That's why I will introduce the more detail later in my talk. The other one called the skill the variance. They try to scale the variance versus the, the mean. They test if this skill is one, equal to one or beyond the one. They test, they find the over dispersion. So also we propose some non-parametric method based on the sandwich estimation. I'm going to introduce more detail later. That's all I can give today for this uh, detailed over dispersion. That's for the cross-sectional data. Cross-sectional means that for each subject, you measure only once. And if you want to know more details, a couple of years ago, we published this paper, to re this review paper to review what's the statistical method for the old person in the RNC data. And, uh, you know, I think it's free to download online. You can feel free to download online if you are interested on this review. So this, as I mentioned, this for the detailed old person in cross-sectional data. Cross-sectional, everybody measure only once. However, in clinical research, and especially in autonomous disease, uh, uh, research. We do lots of clinical trials, and a lot of people are followed for a long time, even for decades. You know, we have some data uh, research here in uh, Northwest, and we follow maybe 20 years. And uh, for this, for everybody, we have lots of follow up. So, everybody, each subject is measured multiple times. We call it repeated measures. In this case, we have some new statistical challenge because the regular statistical uh, method is for the assume each observation are independent from each other, for example, t-test or NOAA. But as right now, lots of measures are correlated with, with each other because they are measured from the same subjects. This is called the long-term data in clinical trials. And also, because we follow them for such a long time, some, some people may be like a loss of follow-up in the middle, 
or unfortunately died or moved, they cannot follow up anymore. So we have lots of missing data. So the challenge, this is a new challenge. But the first, let's talk about how to model longitudinal data. Longitudinal data, right nowadays, we have two major methods to model longitudinal data. The first one is called the mixed fed model, and then the second one is called the GEE, generalized estimate equations. For the mixed event model, as I mentioned, the major challenge is the uh, inherent correlation for the repeated measures from same subjects. For the mixed event model, it's a, they do this. They have the fixed effect and also the random effect. They combine together. That's why it's called the mixed event model. Of course, this is when the weight continues. However, we are going to talk about the count today. So when the weight is categorical, for example, if the weight count, what we do is we add a link function, we call the L link function. Link function will link this Y to the original mix effect. For example, for count data, the link function is log link. So when we use the link function, we call this model as a generalized linear mix effect model, or GLMM. The other type is GEE. This is use the sandwich estimator. My non-parametric method is intended for the, this, uh, this method. I will give more, de uh, more detail later. And then my method, we, we call the our method a non-parametric method, and we, we will talk about it later. But now, remember two popular methods now for the longitudinal counts, GLMM and GEE. Lots of people will ask me immediate question. Okay, what are their difference? How do you design decide that we should use DRM or GEE. Therefore, a couple of years ago, we did this paper to compare GEE versus the GLM for the longitudinal count response. This paper is like maybe 20, 15 or 20 page. I won't go through the full paper, but I do want to share the take home message from this paper. <clears throat> take home message from this paper, okay, is a GEE is more robust to the distribution misspecification, and the GLMM is more sensitive to this distribution assumption. But when we for the count data, when we talk about the distribution assumption or the distribution misspecification, what do they mean? Because for count data, we usually use the Poisson. When we use the Poisson, the most common violation for the distribution assumption is the over expression, as we mentioned. Fortunately, if you do the GLMM and then we use the SARS procedure and R package, most of them they claim they are able to handle over expression for the counts. If only you can set a, you know, set a the set of, uh, you know, uh, uh, appropriately. That's what the software claim. But when I use the software, I always ask question, are they reliable? Do they really perform as they, they tell you? You know, for the R package, everybody can upload their own package. You know, will this guy do the good uh, quality control? We don't know. <clears throat> That's why a couple of years ago, my group compared the performance of different software, the R package, such procedures, to model longitudinal data, longitudinal counts, use the GLMM. What we did, we simulate data. We simulate data either follow margin to follow Poisson, mean no earth person, or margin to follow next binomial, there is earth person. Now we add the, you know, the correlation by the random effect. Here is a uh, simulation result. In this one, we simulate data with the uh, margin follow Poisson, there no earth person. The within subject the correlation is pretty small, less than 0 0.05. We simulate data for different sample size, 50, 100, and 300. Now, we, after we simulate the data set, we fit the data set to use the different R package and such procedures, estimate the slope. The true slope of the simulate data we know is one. So we estimate this slope and then we record it. And then we simulate another data, and then we estimate the, uh, the slope again. We repeat it for 1,000 times, 1,000 times. So we get the 1,000 estimation for the slope for 1,000 different similar data. Now we summarize this 1,000 estimation of slope by this. We put the mean, the every number at the black square here, the standard, <coughs> standard division at the bar here. You can see if your estimation is good, your black square should be pretty close to this vertical line because this vertical line is the true value with similar data, the one. Your error bar should be small. That means good estimation. You can see for this case, when there are no earth pressure and small correlation, all those R, uh, R package and such procedures have very good performance, very good. However, if Martin follow next binomial with the earth pressure, you can see, okay, lots of R package all the, almost all our package mess up. They are highly biased. You know, the black square is far from this vertical line. And that's for the skewed small correlation about the, the word dispersion. How about uh, 
no, 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 or no, or this person with the large correlation and the super large correlation. You can see still good here for no or this person, but the correlation becomes 0.5. However, if you increase the correlation to a very high number, like a 0.9, you can see some such procedures like G, uh, Glimix, it mess up. That's for the no or this person. However, if it matters for the next binomial, you add or this person, most of software mess up. Most of mess up with the even the moderate correlation 0.5. When you increase the correlation to 0.9, it further mess up. So the only way we find the reliable is called the SAS procedure NR mix. All the other mess up, mess up. They are not reliable. So it gives us a new challenge. So uh, we, how, we, yeah. Uh, yeah. there was a question about one of the um, software programs. Okay, let me see. Question: Type error. Let me see. Here, the time error here is not very reliable because the sample size is very small. You know, for the same same procedure or same situation, we can see the time error for the larger sample size, which, uh, which is more reliable here. You can see it here, it's very reliable. Here it's very, very big because it's messed up. You see, it's very highly biased. But then when, when, when this is uh, less bias, it's better. When we check the top error, maybe we want to check the large sample size, we not highly biased. Highly biased means uh, mess up is not good. You can see here, you can see here, when it's not uh, mess up, most top error is good here. Very close to 0 0.05. But this one, why this one is the, equal to 0.42, I think the bias. You can see the black square is the, from, it's a, the, it's the bias from the vertical line. Okay, so here, as I mentioned, the new challenge is how to detect all the protein in large counts. And also, because you know the parametric method doesn't work well, they may want to pro propose a robust non parametric method that not rely on the distribution assumption. And also, as I mentioned, they have lots of missing data in the large counts, how to address missing data. That's why. Uh, in 2017, we published this paper, a non-parametric model to address all the first account response in a long-term data setting with the missingness. So that's the next couple of slides would be very statistical theoretical. If you don't have statistical ground, uh, background, I want to just give you a brief idea. If you don't understand everything, that's perfectly fine because that's a very mathematical and technical. So we propose our method with the functional response model. Here the introduction for the functional response model. So the way it response vector, f is the functional response, response function. So f is function of y. So h is corresponding to most function to the uh, f. So e f equal to h. Theta our parameter interest. I want you to pay attention to the q. So your sample is the n, is the n. Q is the the integer from one to n. So let's find the, for the sample q. When q equal to one, it means that each time you take only one separate from your sample size to the f function, uh, get the f function. So that's probably the same as what we did to reg regularly. You get this uh, one single observation, single separate observation. However, if we set the q equal to two, it means each time you take a two subjects from your sample size n and do a response function. So how many, how many different ways you can take a two subject from sample size n? Should it be n to the two? So many different combinations, right? That's why we call this as a functional response model because uh, traditionally you get a response from a single subject, but now we get you the general function from the multiple subjects. I want to give, quickly give you an example. For example, if you set your Q equal to two, and uh, this is uh, my definition for my response function. My response function has two elements. The first element is uh, for, if you take these two subjects, you take the average. Second uh, element for the response function is you take the difference square and divide, then divide by two. So I can derive a partition of my response function would be equal to the h function, which is the, the first element corresponding to the mu. The second element equal to the corresponding to the variance, sigma square. So that's definition setting for my response function for this special scenario. And uh, how to estimate the, my parameter interest? I can just sum up all of my functional, uh, you know, functional response function and then take the average. And that's for the cross section data. And I can very easily to extend this one to the longitude data because now I just only need to add a one more index for the M for time points. 
I can keep everything else the same. It takes too long to kill data. Very easy. And then I derive the same one. Same one I want to describe, okay, for this setting, my, my estimation for my parameter is follow asymptotic normal distribution. And then I can derive the asymptotic variance, the variance matrix in a closed form. That's my serum one. So once I have serum one for my distribution, my parameter interface at the head, I can test over the person for multiple time points. For example, if I have three time points, I have mu one and sigma one, sigma square one for four time points, and I have total three. I want to test if the, there are no old person in all three time points. So this is my hypothesis. The time one, time points one, no old person. Time point two, no old person. Time point three, no old person. That's my hypothesis. So I can rewrite my hypothesis to this format if I define the complex matrix K, right? The same. So by serum one, I can know this term, it will follow a simple normal distribution. And then the null hypothesis, null hypothesis is this, this is equal to zero. The, the mean for the simple normal distribution would be a vector of zeros. Actually, the vector of three zeros, you know, first zero from here, second zero from here, third zero from here. So this is the this is a vector of three zeros. So and the null hypothesis, I can write the world statics. The world statics will follow car square distribution. Degree freedom would be equal to the number of rows here. So of course, you know, my method is very powerful. Not only test the word expression, I can test many, many different, you know, hypothetical what you are interested. For example, if you switch your interest, you want to test, okay, the mean is the same for all the same time points, variance is the same for all the same time points. You can rewrite your matrix, contrast the matrix K and then re-derive this. And this word set will follow chi square distribution with degree freedom of four. This is where the degree freedom is number of the rows here. So how to how good is my method? I want to I want to check, I want to examine the performance of our method. So what I did is I perform simulation. First, I generate the longitude data and the marginally it follow percent. And also I use the copy method to add a correlation for these three time points. Correlation is point two. So after similar data, I estimate the mean and the variance for different sample sites for the all three time points, this mean and the variance. Also, I test this hypothesis. Now, what is the no old expression, all the three time points? I know this is not what is true because I simulate data, right? And uh, I got the p value. Then I compare my p value with the 0 0.05. Then I simulate another random data and repeat this process for 1,000 times. So I got 1,000 p values, right? So, and the hypothesis if your method works very well, it's perfect. Your p-value should follow a uniform zero to one distribution, right? And then because it's correct, if because I compare my p-value with the 0 0.05, less than 0 0.05, so the perfect one, I should get this time error should be very close to 0 0.05. You can see for large sample size, I got my p-value, the time error pretty close to 0 0.05. It only inflated when the sample size is 50 is small. It's just like the moment ago, the simulation I showed. It's an inflated when I mean, your sample size is small. That's very normal. I have another question here. Let me check. Uh, okay. So let's check the time of error. Then I want to check the power of my uh, my simulation, the, my method. Power is okay. If uh, my assumption that doesn't hold, will I correctly, you know, reject my null hypothesis? So I simulate data. Which for negative follow uh, which manually follow negative binomial for all same time points. The mean, the true mean is a five, the true variance is 10. So the over this person is two. That's pretty small over the person if you are familiar with this field. So I test this hypothesis. Now hypothesis, of course, is wrong because my order person is two, not the other order person. So I record in advanced sound in the simulation, I record how many times my p-value will be less than 0 0.05. You know, a perfect test should be every time you reject your number of tests because it is wrong. For in one thousand times, when the sample time is 200 or 300, I always reject the number of tests. I mean, I got the perfect power, one, exactly one. And the only when the small sample time is equal to 50, my power is still 0.9. This is still pretty good power because, as you know, FDA usually require power equal to 0.8. So I got a 0 0.9, that's even for small sample size. So it means my method had a very good performance actually. 
So till now, so far, all the methods I have introduced, we have developed a shine, online shine app. This thing we have introduced. And I want to discuss a little bit more for the uh, missing data. So as I mentioned, you know, missing data is so common for longitudinal data. Um, before you move on, there's a, another question. OK, thank you. Uh, this, the question is, the, is the sample size each arm or both arm? The sample, the sample size is for, we only have one arm here, but three time points. The sample size, for example, 50 is 50 for time point one, time point two, time point three. Or simulation. This is a simulation for the type of error, type of error thing. Here, the, the, the sample size for each time point, but there are only one arm. Okay. So how to model missing data? You know, probably like 40 years, uh, 35 years ago, uh, Ruben, you know, classified the distribution or missing, missingness or DOM by three different categories. Missing completely at random or MCR. MCR it means, okay, you're missing that not depend on the covariance or outcome, completely miss randomness. That is MCR. Otherwise, if your DOM distributing or missing is depending on covariance and observe the outcome, we call the missing at the random. So any violation of the missing at the random or MAR, we call the missing not at random, MCR. So that's the classification of the DOM. But you know, missing not easy to, uh, to, to handle. Even for the MAR, it still usually you need a more additional assumption to handle missingness. So for example, first I use the indicator to indicate if I observe this value. For example, for the group I, for the subject I in group K at the time M, if this measurements was observed, I have indicator to indicate at one. If this measurement is missing, I use the indicator at zero. This is my indicator for the if I observe the, the you know the data for this particular uh, particular data point. <clears throat> so we add additional assumption to, to handle the missing. We use the Montanic missing data painting. Montanic missing data, uh, data painting or MMDP means, okay, my missing for the subject I in group K at time, time M rely on the only rely on the wet theta. Wet theta is a collection of the observation from time, time point of one to time point of M minus one. Okay, it means my missing today is only related with my history. It won't, won't be related to even my future. So my missing is it only related to my previous observations, won't be related with my future. That makes sense because you know, for somebody who follow up, lost a follow up or like died, that missing is probably only related to his history, right? So once I have this additional assumption for the MMDP, I can handle my missing it using the logic regression. You know, I have indicator here, zero and one. So this is my new outcome. This is my logistic regression new outcome. I try to model this logistic regression is equal to one or zero with my observations. This is my history observations. So we call this my probability or missingness or not, we call it at the pair. So if I found my missingness is not related with my observation, we mean that, okay, if my beta is zero, it means my missing data is the MCR, right? Not related to my observations. If beta is not a zero, it means the MAR. We try to use the logistic range to difference between MAR and the MCR. Okay, once I did this, I, I fit in the logistic regression, I can estimate the probability of missingness, maximum pair. So once I got my pair, the pair head for the missing, uh, for the, for the uh, missing observation or not, so I will use this pair to add a weight here. You know, previously I have the H function, I have my response function, but now I add a weight. The weight is the numerator is you observe this data point or not. The denominator is your per, the chance to observe this data points. This is called an inverse probability weight. That's a typical way to handle missing data. So once the, how I have that, I redefine my uh, function response function. So I have the new, this new term. So once I have this new term, I derived, you know, previously, this is still my theta head. I, this is still my theta head. But now we are estimating my theta head, I add this uh, inverse probability weight. Then I can still derive our, the, the theta head still follows a similar normal distribution. The dust, because the variance, correct, uh, the variance matrix is more complex. Previously, I only have this term, but now I have this new term, the psi. Psi, 
that's a new term for the variance because I have missing it. I spend, you know, spend some effort for the estimate for the missing it and also for the inverse probability. But anyway, I derived all the mathematical uh, formula for this uh, for the term. This is uh, this is pretty complex. You know, everything here the accurate matrix, very complex. I won't go, want to go to go through all the details, but I do want to share you, with you is a simulation result <clears throat> for the power. I only have time for power because I need to save some time for this. So let's see. Okay, I similar data for three data three time points. Marginally, it is followed next by normal, but I set a very small error dispersion. I said my error dispersion is only 1.5. I want to see if my method can detect a very small error dispersion, if it's powerful enough. So for the time one, I have no missing data. For time two, I think I have I said a 10% missing data. For time three, I said a 20% missing data. But the missing follow missing data follow MMDP. I mean it's it's missing at the time two, it may missing or not missing at time three. But if it's a, but if it's a missing at a, it a, uh, oh, it a, it means okay. If it's missing at time two, it always a missing at time three. But sometimes it did not missing at time two. It it is missing at time three. That's a monotonic missing data pattern. And I add a correlation point two between different time points. That's a pretty complex longitudinal data with the missingness. And I try to see if my method can detect a very small word dispersion. I try to detect what's the power. For different sample size, I thought, okay, my method, the pretty, our method, is pretty good. Get a perfect power for large sample size, three hundred. Get a very good power for the sample size equal to two hundred. Even for sample size is one hundred, we got the power point seven eight six. It's not good only for the small sample size fifty. But think about this: the old dispersion is only one point five. It's non tuned data, and you also have missing. You still have get the power like this. That means okay, if you want to get a Reliable result, you need a little bit larger sample size. 100 gives you reliable power. So that's the method that I'm this, uh, summary, uh, uh, proposed today. So let me summarize. We discussed the significance of model count data. We discussed the old dispersion in cross section counts. Also, we proposed a new method to detect the old dispersion in longitudinal counts. And we compared the GRM with GE and detect the old dispersion in longitudinal counts. And finally, we attend our method to try to detect the old person missing data. Next step, Nathan will uh, talk about the, our online shiny APP to use this, our method to help people to, to detect the old person. Okay, I will stop sharing. Uh, I did not see any additional question. Uh, so Nathan, it's your turn now. Okay. Okay, thanks, Hui. Um, so I'm gonna to talk to you about a easy to use online tool that we developed that will help you um, perform some of these analyses and run these tests and see if there is or isn't over dispersion in your data. So you can choose an appropriate method. So the, the app is written in something called R Shiny, which is basically a web interface for R programs. And the big benefit of R Shiny is that it lets you harness all the power of R, but it doesn't, you don't need to, the user doesn't need to know any R programming to be able to use the app. So all of this, all that stuff that we was talking about happens behind the scenes and you just have to upload your data and, and um, use this nice interface that we've made. So yeah, so the app gives you a, a nice interface where you can upload your data, either cross-sectional or longitudinal. Uh, you can use the methods that we described at least most of them, um, to test for over dispersion. And you can actually get p-values for um, no hypotheses of no over dispersion. And this is, this is the link to the app. I'm going to run it locally on my computer because it's easier for presentation purposes. Um, so I will head over there now. One second. Okay, so here's the app. This is the, the homepage. There are a few um, navigational tabs up here at the top. There's an analysis tab, which is where you'll do all of the actual um, computing. 
and you can see there's a cross-sectional data tab and a longitudinal data tab. Um, there are some examples of all, some of the different kinds of scenarios you might run across. Um, there's a manual with some pretty detailed instructions for how to use the app. And then if you have further questions, there's contact information for us and we'd be happy to help you if you're using this in your research. So let me go back to the cross-sectional data tab. Um, I don't know if you'll see the window pop up, but you hit browse. Um, I'm gonna select a data set. So this is a, the Quine data is a common um, example data set in statistics for illustrating different methods. Um, and before I show you, before I set everything up, there's a view data tab where you can check to make sure that the data you've uploaded um, actually got uploaded the way you expected. Sometimes things happen if some, the most common error is that some file formats, um, the first column will get dropped maybe. And so if that happens, then you can add like a dummy column to your data set and then re-upload. So this is just to see if there's, if anything like that um, happened. So in this data set, we have a, um, our count responses days absent from school. So this data set is about um, how many days of school students missed, I think in Australia. So this is the number of days that students missed in a year, and then some demographic information about the students. So we wanna know is there over dispersion in, this, in these counts of um, uh, school absences. So the, after you've uploaded your data file, you can choose if you wanna adjust for covariates, covariates or not. These first two methods, the Dean and Lawless method and the negative binomial method, um, it's possible to adjust for covariates. It's not possible in the non-parametric method. So first I'll show you those, those first two so we can adjust for covariates. We're prompted to enter the response variable, which in this case is days. And these labels come from the file you upload. Whatever the first line is of your data file, that's where these names come from. So it'll be different when you do it. So we can select, I'll just choose all of them and hit submit. So then I will head over to this Dean and Lawless tab. So the Dean and Lawless method is based on fitting an actual garden variety plus on distribution to the data and seeing how big the residuals in the model are, the difference between the fitted values and the actual values, how big those are compared to what you'd expect from data that actually is from a Poisson distribution. And that's what this plot is showing. This shows the fitted values on the x-axis versus the actual raw data values on the y-axis. And the shaded region is where you'd expect most of the data points to fall if there's no over dispersion, if the data actually comes from a Poisson distribution. And you can see from this plot that in this data set, a lot of the points fall far outside the shaded region, which is strong visual evidence of over dispersion. And the test also generates an actual test statistic and p-value. Um, I won't get into the details, but basically the test statistic, assuming there's no over dispersion, should follow a standard normal distribution the value of the test statistic in this case is 100, which is very, very large for a normal distribution. So the p-value is basically zero. It's so small that the computer just rounds it to zero. Um, so in this case, we would reject a null hypothesis of no dispersion. So there would be over dispersion here. You'd want to choose an appropriate um, method like the quasi-Poisson or um, negative binomial or something to analyze this. If we go over to the negative binomial tab, this method Instead of fitting a Poisson distribution, we fit a negative binomial distribution, which has an additional parameter that describes how much variability there is over and above what you'd expect from a typical Poisson distribution. And if that parameter has a value of zero, the negative binomial model actually is the same thing as the Poisson model. So testing for over dispersion in this case is the same thing as testing whether or not that parameter has a value of zero. So this will fit the model for you. And it'll tell you a confidence interval for that parameter, which is usually called theta. In this case, the confidence interval does not contain zero. So we can be pretty sure that the, that, that, that theta parameter is in fact larger than zero, indicating over dispersion, which again agrees with what we saw 
in the Dean and Lawless tab. And if you go to the non-parametric tab, it'll tell you that you can't do it with covariates. So we'll have to go here and select no and resubmit. So since it's non-parametric, it really just is about comparing the mean and the variance directly. So intuitively, the farther apart, the smaller, the bigger the gap between the mean and the variance, the stronger the evidence is for overdispersion. Um, and so this will perform that test that we was talking about and actually formally tell you, um, it'll give you a p-value based on that test. Um, and again, very small. So all three methods, we reject the null hypothesis of no overdispersion. Um, okay, before I move on to longitudinal data, I wanna show you an example of what data with, without overdispersion looks like. Uh, there we go. Um, so this is one of the example tabs. You're, you can download the example data if you wanna see what it looks like, or we can just go over to this tab. And this is just data that I simulated because it's hard to find data that aren't <laughs> over dispersed. Um, so we have a count and then some covariates that I generated. And so if we, oh, I do wanna uh, select covariates. So here, obviously very, very different looking, but almost all the points fall within that shaded region. Um, if your data looks like this, you are very lucky, <laughs> um, but this is um, what, you, what you get if you have no over dispersion. Again, un unlikely to see data that's this good. <laughs> um, okay, I'll switch over to longitudinal data. And here there's only, there's only the one um, non-parametric method that we described without, and this, this doesn't, doesn't yet support the missing data method, which was the last thing he talked about. But I will put in the example. So there's also a, a plot here, similar to the, that other plot, the shaded region is where you'd expect the points to fall if there's no over dispersion. And here, um, the points are just plotted with time. So as the as time goes on, the, the mean increases and the variance also increases, but seems to increase a lot faster than the mean, which is exactly what over dispersion is. And again, you get the p-value um, basically zero. So you'd again re you'd reject uh, the null hypothesis here. Um, yeah, that's about that's about it. Um, any questions about about that? Yeah, I want to emphasize that because uh, we put an example here. The example, you can download the example data. So you can see if you yeah. want to use our shiny APP, which kind of data format you should put it. Oh, yeah. I should let me um, talk about um, file formats. So if you go to, I wanted to go to view data here. So for the longitudinal data, the, um, the program accepts data in wide format, which means that every row corresponds to a subject. And the first column has just some kind of subject label on it. And again, this is um, described in the, in the manual tab. Um, or you can, if you go to the examples, if you hit download example data, you can download the file and, and try to make your file look like, look like that so that it's read properly by the program. And the, re the reason we chose to do um, wide format data for longitudinal data is that this is a, pretty commonly, this is what, in our experience, people tend to have. And so that we figured this would, um, this way people, you would have to do the least amount of um, reconfiguring data. And for the um, cross-sectional data, um, this is this is in um, long format. So each each column, each row is a single observation. So yeah. Um, we have a question about whether there's a maximum number of observations. Um, no, I mean it's it's whatever the it's the maximum limit in R is, which is which you're unlikely to exceed like millions. I think, um, I mean, people people analyze 
you know, um, like high, high throughput sequencing data in R, and it's it's fine. Um, you can increase the number of entries you see here too with uh, this tab, but yeah. So yeah, no, no maximum that you're likely to run into. So in the in the chat box, I put a link for this Shannon app. If you click that link, you can play it with it by, with it by yourself. And then, uh, Nathan, can you show the menu? We also have um, a menu. Here. Yeah, there are a couple more questions actually. So one is, um, how long will it take to run a sample of a thousand? Um, very fast, like almost instantaneous. I think. Um, none of this none of this is really computationally intensive actually. Um, Maybe um, maybe the non-parametric method might be a little bit slower because you have to compute so many pairs, but um, I don't. You're not going to be waiting hours, I think. Um, maybe it's like one or two minutes. Yeah. Um, okay. What does the gray area mean in the longitudinal example? Let me go back to that. So for every, every time point, so let's take um, time point eight. So the center of the gray area is the mean of all of those points. And the height of the, of the gray area, or the, I guess the distance from the middle to the top or the bottom is the expected, if those data came from a Poisson distribution, with mean equal to their computed mean, um, how much variability would you expect there to be? So a Poisson with a mean, this looks like a mean of about um, like 60 maybe. So a Poisson distribution with a mean of 60, if you simulated data from that distribution, you would expect it all to fall into the shaded region here. And because there are so many points that are outside of it, um, that's evidence of an over dispersed um, data set. Um, okay, does the app allow only CSV files? You can also upload Excel files and probably some others that I haven't tried, but that's why that view data tab is there so that you can make sure that whatever format you um, submit in, it got read in properly, but I know for sure that it can take Excel files and CSVs. Um, so someone asked if the app can convert long to wide. Um, not at the moment, you'd have to um, wrangle the data beforehand um, before you can analyze it, yeah. But that's something we might, um, that's a, a, something we could potentially work on in the future. But some, that's something, it's some, sometimes hard to automate that because different data sets have different quirks. Um, so, yeah. This is, do you want to show the manual? We have a manual there. Oh yeah, the manual, yeah. Um, so this is um, their instructions here, um, which goes through most of what I just said and talked about. Um, uh, more, more questions. Um, so can this be used on longitudinal data that um, have repeated measures collected not at the same planned time points? Um, I don't think so, right, Hui? Uh, no, this is a similar idea like a GEE. Uh, for longitudinal data, if you collect as, you know, for example, if you have multiple time points, you, you don't have missing data, it still can use it. But if you collect a different, not planned time points, that's would be our next step. We are, you know, in GEE, you can use the weighted GEE. And here, our idea is similar like a weighted GEE. I already, already introduced the theoretical part. Next time, Nathan will write some programming for the extend this method to the missing data. We already have a method already. It doesn't write the more, you know, additional shiny at this function. We will add it in. Now it could be if um. So obviously, like the cleanest longitudinal study, you know, all the subjects come in on the same day, and you take a response, and then they come in, and then you take a response. But it could be like 
you know, people, whenever they en enroll, you know, the first visit is, you know, a year after that, and then in subsequent years, and it's something like, um, you know, years after enrollment, and they're all different days, but if you think you can analyze it as, you know, year one, year two, year three in the study, then you, you could do that. Um, yeah. But, you, right. but yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, I was just, but that's not, that might not, not always be um, appropriate to the particular setting. Yeah. So yeah, oh. be careful. Be careful if it's not all the, if it's not at the same time point. Yeah. Or if you label your time point as visit one, visit two, visit three, if only you align the data well, but you can use our uh, Shine ABP. But of course, if you have missing, that's our next step. We will put the missing feature, you know, data feature in the, in the Shine ABP. I guess I just wanted to emphasize that don't, don't, don't try to align the data just so that you can use this method. Make sure that it's, a, it's appropriate to align the data first before you. Um, Definitely. Don't just, don't just do it just so you can use this. Mm -hmm. That's all. Okay, and then we also list our content information in the Shine APP. If you, yep. the time. If you have any question, yeah. contact us. If you have questions about the um, specific methods, particularly the non-parametric ones, I would direct your questions to Hui. Mm -hmm. If your questions are more about um, technical issues, like file formats and formatting, that kind of thing, um, I would just uh, send me an email. Yeah. And, I see my email is not there, so I will I will add that. Let's add the in. <laughs> um, uh, Ryan, you know that's a new question. Can this be used if V0, V3 have data, V2 have the missing? In that case, you cannot use it run, uh, directly, but what you can do is you do some uh, uh, missing imputation, fill the data in and use it. Because uh, this does not follow the MMDP. That's a more complex uh, method will be needed. Uh, Nathan, can you can you stop sharing? Let me share my screen. Yep. Uh, I want to share my screen. I really want to thank the NACC offer us the opportunity to introduce you know this uh, our master and also this shiny APP. You know this is a topic. Uh, Couple, several months ago, we have a national NACC virtual meeting. This is a topic we discussed. At that time, I replied asking in the chat box. And then uh, I think I had a contact me for the possibility, you know, and then we developed this uh, APP and we present today. We really appreciate the support from NACC. And also, as I mentioned, we have support from the Metro Center for the Cognitive Neurology and Autonomous Disease Center here at the Northwestern. We appreciate their support. Also, I have a secondary appointment there. And my, pre my primary appointment, and also Nathan also in the both this and meet myself I'm in the division by set department of Prevent medicine and the Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. We appreciate support from our division department. And do you have any additional question? You know, feel free to ask. I saw some new. These slides will be posted, right? So that they'll, everyone will have the link to the app. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, I put, yeah. The, I put the link in the, in the chat box. Okay. Great. Well, thank you both for your wealth of information you've shared with us today and for this wonderful tool walking us through it. Um, as for more data core webinars, you can always look on the NAC website under the ADRC webinars tab for upcoming information, as well as to view past webinars and maybe share a link with one of your colleagues um, because we always record them and post them to our YouTube channel. Um, but thank you again um, for attending today and um, looking forward to hosting more. Okay. Have a good afternoon, everyone.